Sorry. <laughs> so um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from December 10th, 2018, April 8th, 2019, January 13th, 2020, and um, the special session from December 7th, 2018. So, unless there's an objection, I would ask for approval for these all at the same time, unless you have an objection. Yeah, there's only one problem with the April 8th, 2019. Um, I know we took a break, and it shows in there in the minutes that we took a break, but they never put the minutes us going back to the meeting, and that was left out. And okay. I was reading it. So, other than that, I don't see a problem. Okay, do I have a second to approve with that? Correction? Do you second it? Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So, um, I have four citizens' comments that we will do very um, quickly because there will be three minutes each. Um, the first one is Jojo Lowe, uh, the library and the groundbreaking. Joanna Lowe or Jojo, 139 East Central Avenue. Um, Tara Hall could not be here tonight, so I just want to make a, a couple of announcements. March 20th will be the groundbreaking for the Library Educational Center. It is a Friday, and it will start at 4 p.m. Um, it's hard to tell how long it'll be, probably about an hour, and then we'll have refreshments and meet the artist afterwards in the library. So that's Friday, March 20th. A couple of things in February on the 14th are the senior, Howie Senior Singles. We're having a gathering from four to six in the library for Valentine's Day. And the third Friday, uh, the artist of February will be Peggy Ernest. And it's not just Peggy, it's three generations of the Ernest family. Uh, including John and Peggy and their children and grandchildren. And if you haven't been by the library, it is a treat, let me tell you, from the one-year-old to the 80-year-old. So that will be the third Friday, which is February 21st. Thank you. Sean O'Keefe. Good evening. I'm speaking tonight as the newly elected president of the Howie Men's Club. And every year we have every year after we have our elections, we come to town hall and we announce the results and we take this opportunity to invite people to join the Howie Men's Club as well. Um, so I'm the new president, uh, Doug McCormick from Yalaha is the new vice president. Uh, we meet every first Tuesday of the month over at the Mission Inn. Uh, we usually have a speaker of general interest, a social hour. So we meet about 5 o'clock. It goes to 7.30 or 8. Um, and our, March 3rd is our next meeting. We do invite you. Um, we have frequent speakers, and we do fundraising events throughout the year as well, especially our pancake breakfast. Um, so check out our Facebook page or ask at the library or ask me if you see me, um, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have about the Howie Men's Club. Thank you. Mr. Kelly? I don't know why, but on the agenda I saw, left off that the comments came at the end of the meeting. But anyhow. Would you like to go with the second one, or do you want to do just I would rather go with the that second would be one. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Mr. Benson, did you want to speak now or at the end? All right. 
Okay, so the next item is new business. It's consideration and approval to appoint Rachel Bartolowitz uh, to Parks and Recreation Board. Um, Pat, did you want to say anything, or is Rachel here? Rachel. Oh, Rachel. Uh, <coughs> Charter Review Board. Those people are Dan Powers, Graham Well, Donna Klein, Sal Galelli, Pat Miller, Bernice Power, and Kathleen Ormsby. Those are the only seven applications that we received. And they have, um, I have reconfirmed with them all, they are willing to participate. And we have a potential start date at, towards the end of this month. So do I have a motion to approve those people to the Charter Review Board? So moved. Okay, we'll do a roll call then for that. Councilman Thomas? Yeah. Uh, as I requested the last time we, when we voted on the pension, I think we should be able to separate some of these people. Some of these people are in good standing as residents and, and make good decisions, and some people haven't. And I think it should be uh, recognized the people that have made some bad decisions uh, towards the town and towards what the official through social media and, uh, and through the public. So I don't think it's fair to the good people on this list to suffer for the people that are going back. We're going to consider them as a group. Um, there, we passed a motion and uh, approved the commission or the review board uh, for seven people, and we really need the the charter to be reviewed. We have to start this work. We need to bring it into the 21st century. It's over 15 years old. I understand that. And I, I think just to, just to get on record um, the comments they made so you know what you're voting on, at least for some of them, and almost like put your name in front of those comments. And it's just, don't put my name, put your name, your name and Mr. Neeple's name as well as some of these inappropriate comments. And I have to start with um, Dan Powers. Dan Powers, uh, the creator that... Uh, Facebook page, the Facebook, the Facebook page uh, unedited, uh, <coughs> slandering remarks towards council members. Uh, one is McGill is an arrogant tyrant and embarrassing to the town. He last. Uh, we need public comment Truth to be at the podium only, please. Thank you. <coughs> My point. Uh, acting like a coward, several comments like that. Um, uh, I'm thinking of offering McGill a minimum wage job removing gum. Uh, yeah. It's been working uh, all the time. Uh, please. Thank you. Wouldn't give me access. And there's so many. There's like, I think it was 72 of them that are inappropriate, but that need to go through all. So I think you get the point. And then the next one is Donna Klein. I mean, these people shown that they're having a difficult time working with their fellow residents, never mind working with their, their government. And you got Donna Klein right here calling a council member a loser, <coughs> uh, making fun of another resident, uh, Marty Drabeck, for the assault, calling her a drama queen, uh, using profanity towards the councilman, calling him a chicken and a profanity word, and he called uh, Councilman Scott that as well. Um, and I guess that there's probably seven, eight with her as long. So once again, if you put your name next to those comments, 
you know, there, there's a difference between free speech and an attack on a council member, and now they want to work with the council, and they want to work with our government. Something as important as the charter, and our charter committee. And then you got Pat Miller making fun of residents, uh, saying uh, everyone who supports McGill is an idiot. McGill has become delusional. McGill is a McGill, I was just hoping you address the inappropriate comments in our audience. McGill is such a sad person. So these are the these are the people I think should be separated because of their comments, and the other good people on the list uh, shouldn't suffer for it. Not only that, <clears throat> I've been accused of getting a discount on my water bill uh, as a bribe. So, I mean, I agree with Councilor McGill that some of these people, like Sal and Graham, should be on the board. As far as I'm concerned, the rest of them should not be allowed on the board. So, Microphone. So my point of view is all these people work hard for the town. They attend meetings. Uh, it is a, the uh, Charter Review is a public meeting. Uh, so all meetings will have notes. The public is invited to attend. Um, it is a cross-section. Um, I'm sure some of them, Sal, Sal has, for instance, inferred some things at meetings. I'm not going to visit them. But Sal is a thoughtful person, and he, and he works hard for the city. Uh, so I, I fully support uh, passing these people as, as, as an entirety. I a comment. The difference between Sal and most of these are Sal comes here and he speaks in front of all of us about what his problem is or what his issues is with each one of us, not behind our back on the Facebook page. And do you know how many meetings these people have been to? Ed? I don't come. <laughs> well, you said they come to meetings. They do. And I, I, I'd be really careful about the kettle calling the pot black. And so. just because they come to meetings and they volunteer, that makes them a good person to be on the, the board? They do know what is going on in town. Um, I have uh, met with, well, I've met with almost all of these people, and actually all of them, um, and feel that especially that they have new perspectives. They have perspectives of longtime citizens. They have, we have people from uh, Venezia, from the west side, from the east side, and I think that it is a good cross section, and that's really important as far as what we're looking for in the Charter Review Committee. We have people who have worked in government, people who are lay people, and I really think that this is an exceptional committee. And so I would like to consider them as a whole. Any to comment the on the comments they made about me from the mayor? Any feeling about it? Any? No, I don't think so. <coughs> no. Okay, no comment, thanks. So um, I would like a motion. Do we have a motion? We yes. And we had a second. Um, so. Uh, approval to, for um, the seven people who are um, volunteering to be on the Charter Review Board. So, Councilor Neville? Yes. Okay, that was for Mayor Potam Conroy. Yes? No. No. So, motion passes three to two. <laughs> okay. So, the update on Venezia North. There, is, excuse me, there have been questions about um, what currently is happening with Venezia North, which is also known as AKA Talashe, which is the development directly across 19, um, and it is currently being grubbed. And so what I did was I talked to the contractor about what is happening and what the next steps are, just to make sure that um, everybody was on the same page with this. So they took care of the gopher tortoises. They um, harvested, well, that's not, they didn't kill them. They picked them up and moved them to an appropriate location um, so that they would be uh, well but and not injured by this construction effort. Uh, so you've seen that most of the um, trees have been harvested. And from January 20th to April 16th, they are doing earthwork clearing, grubbing, and mass grading. 
um, the grading, and Mr. Ernest is not here due to a uh, death in his family, and so um, he could tell you a little bit more about the grading effort, but what they are doing is making sure that they adhere to and follow the um, guidelines for flood plain, flood zones, um, they are looking at making sure that they adhere to the FEMA requirements for wetlands, etc. So that's kind of what grading entails. Um, they are putting in the sanitary sewer system, the storm drainage system, sanitary sewers from February 24th to June 17th. Storm drainage will uh, go in concurrently from April to July. Then they have the force main, which is from May 14th to May 26th, so it's a very short period of time. Um, the water distribution system will be from May to July. Then they have uh, roadway curbs and sidewalks uh, that go in at that same time, from uh, middle of May through the later part of August. Uh, the list station and power up of the list station is currently scheduled for the middle of June, June 10th. Duke Energy will begin putting in the power poles and the power from the middle of June through the end of August. The landscape and hardscape installation will begin August 1st. And the final walk and um, as builds will be from the last week in August, from August 21st through August 28th. And then they'll record the final plat. And this is all considered the improvements for the land. This is normally done under the preliminary plat, if they try to give it to the town uh, the, by doing a final plat before that, or recording a final plat before the improvements are made, then we have to have a bond initiative. And the town becomes a part of that process. This way, under the preliminary plat, it all stays with the builder. And of course, it's all inspected, and, and we work with the St. John's Water District, etc. cetera. But, um, so this is currently the process and the schedule for the activities. Any questions? No. I do. So we never got them to agree to the back entrance no. or sidewalks on Florida Avenue? No. Um, what was agreed to in um, August of 18 and May of 19 by the council and um, nodded to or um, the consent by our legal team was that if they built it exactly as it had been planned and signed off, then they could move forward. And so that's what they're doing right now. There is an, an emergency exit off of North, uh, excuse me, number two road back there. And so that is a, a breakaway gate for emergency exit. It's already in those plans. And they are using that for all of the construction traffic. So none of the construction traffic is on Florida right now, or at all. Well, I'm not, I'm, well, I mean, that is a worry, but I'm also worried about all the cars coming and going on Florida and then cut down all the side streets along Florida. Right. When they could have just been going out number two road. The um, other consideration was when they were trying to go down to the 62 lots, they were going to increase that to over 120 homes, and it is the 92 homes now. So, or still the 92 homes, or the 93. <laughs> The agenda, was a, or the agenda was amended because we did receive one response to our RFB for the construction work and, on Highland Drive. Um, it's not in your packet, and I don't know why, but I will make sure that you get, uh, everybody gets copies and the copies are available. Um, we haven't made a decision. This was the only response that we received. It is $189,827. And considering the work that they have to do to make that road stable um, and everything that they need to do to make sure that it is a, a viable throughway, uh, that is, I hate to say reasonable, but we have to drive pilings and, and do a lot of work. So um, this will be uh, available for more discussion, but I did want to breach the subject, let you know that we, we did receive one response and um, we will talk and work with Mr. Ernest to figure out what we're going to do. No, this? No, no. <coughs> yes, the RFP did expire. Yes. We 
we have to look at all of our finances on the reserves and the appropriate the transportation reserves to see where we are with the funds in the market. Um, Russ and Miriam didn't get to that. So you said 189. 189, 827. It'd be nice to see the entire proposal. Um, yes. That road be held up for, it's definitely a need. I've brought it up many a time, but I, I told, asked John last time, it seemed a plan A, B, and a C, and a D, you know, to make it safe. And I'd like to see a lot more on that myself. Yes, and they, um, they did actually request that the um, people responding to the RF bus we provide variations. Okay. Um, so this is the least expensive, according to what I discussed briefly with Mr. Ernest last week before he left. Um, so we will have much more discussion on this, but I wanted you to know that it's available and out there. So. It'll be another 10 15 years down the road, we'll have to do it again. If we don't do it right, absolutely. Oh, yeah. well, yeah, you've been around long enough to know how weak that area is now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's why I believe that part of the um, uh, specifications are driving piles, pilings, so, to be able to support the bed so that it, it won't sink more. So, but I don't know that that's. I mean, I know John does his homework. It's just, yeah, you know. yes, exactly. I don't really, can't really answer any questions, but I wanted to make sure that that was out there and that people had the information. The other thing that we have is. Um, as everybody knows, our audit last year was um, not wonderful. And we had many audit findings. And we have subsequently, and it was not the audit firm, right? But the audit firm um, declined to continue in the capacity as auditors. So we have found another auditor, which we approved at a previous meeting. And we have um, subsequently asked the prior auditor and another firm to give us an estimate on what it would take for them to come in and supplement our bill payable um, payroll clerk uh, for some time to help us address these audit findings. And so in the packet are two estimates, one from CRI, which was our old audit firm, and another one from a firm in use. So these are, like I said, they're only discussion items, but we really do have to determine whether we as a town uh, want to continue um, risking audit items and um, the wrath of the state, you know, having the state come in and look at us. If we want to address these um, more in-house and try to work through them ourselves, which we do not really have the staff to do and the skill sets to do, or if we want to bring in somebody um, that has the experience. CRI, the estimate is um, in the $30,000 range. They um, would come in, they have, would come in running, uh, you know, they have all of the background because they have been our auditors for a long time. Uh, and they have uh, quoted us what they have done. We've had a very, Derry and I had a very high level discussion with them on what that would be and when it would be. It does have to be soon because we have to begin the audit process with the new audit firm yesterday. So it, it should begin this, this month before the end of the month. Um, so there are two, two people who have provided information to us and, and we're going to, uh, we have not discussed uh, with the second firm yet, have had a chance to sit down and talk to them yet. When Chris Sears was here, he uh, had issues with the one we have now. Uh, we had a bad audit come back and it was a lot of issues on their side, not ours. He, gave them a second chance, and I think we all agreed on it, to give them one more second chance, and I guess it hasn't changed, so. And it isn't, it isn't so much them, it's, it's our findings. They, we have, um, I don't even know how to really explain it, except that the audit findings are valid audit oh, yeah. findings, so, and um, it, was a, and it was a much more in-depth audit this year than it had been in previous years. Uh, but we do really have some, um, deficits, some areas we need improvement in. The, I know one's an hourly rate, one gives you at the 38,000. Uh, so we're going to wait on an estimate, a better estimate than the hourly rate people, or can, are they comparable, the, the hourly rate compared to what we were paying, or do you know? Um, I'm just trying to talk to it. 
Yeah, right, exactly. Um, in, in both estimates, it gives the management hours versus the, the manager versus the, and so that breakdown is there. What uh, we're trying, the discussion that we will have with the second firm is what, what do they think the um, number of manager hours are? I thought in the CRI estimate, the amount of time a real ad manager had to be involved was quite high. I think uh, hello and when you're done at the end. And then you let people who are doing the real work in at it. So I thought that estimate was very high. Okay. Okay. Do you give any consideration of 38.6? Um, first of all, remember the auditor did say that the findings that they did find that were, were not uncommon to small towns. I didn't, and correct me if I'm wrong, they didn't really say that anything was, in the accounting word, substantial. Um, so kind of my question is, how do we do this cost effectively and maybe as part of the budgeting process next year, um, a real, somebody that has real finance, and I have an employee that does a you know, budget, a real budget director, meaning that they've done it before, they have some accounting background, they're familiar with towns, um, et cetera. Or do you think we really need to do this now? And, if, you know, and I, I'll get on board if you say now, but. Uh, well, we talked earlier in the year, too, about them starting earlier because yep. it was, they were. Oh, yeah, they started right down, down to the wire before they come up with a thing we have to turn in. So we kind of talked about maybe starting in March. The, um, the issue last year was it wasn't them and it, it was us and them, right? right yeah. So they would they came in, did the initial audit, told told our people they needed these things, and when it was time for them, they had scheduled the new meeting. When it was time for them to come back, they called, and we hadn't had the opportunity and the time or the staff or the capacity to actually That's gather brutal. all that information together so that the auditors could come. And so it kept happening like that. Right? So they, we worked on the first scheduled date. Then it was hard for them to fit us in after that, subsequently, and it just became a domino effect. And so, it, it really isn't my decision. It's really a decision of the council and um, of the town staff to determine what we really want to do. If we want to continue kind of limping down the road, doing things adequately, or if we want to um, consider this in the next budget cycle and look at bringing in a full-time financial person who does everything and really understands municipal accounting, um, or you know what we what we want to do? Do we replace an administrative person with a uh, full-time financial? Uh, we just have to really look at that. But I have these estimates. I wanted to share the information with you, make sure that it was out there, and we do need to address those audit items, whether we address them um, one-off with the uh, auditors when they come or whether we had pre-address them with one of these firms and try to clean everything up before our auditors come in. That's kind of the decision. Um, my recommendation is proceed with the interviewing the site and harden the numbers and we'll see what happens. Wasn't it said that it was kind of the same thing as year in and year out? We had additional items this year. Yeah. But we I mean in general, before in general. We, we were kind of doing the same thing, it was the same issues over and over that we hadn't fixed. And that's, that's kind of the reason that um, Darian and I had a talk, and re she's very frustrated with this, wants to make sure that it, we represent ourselves the best we can, and that we're doing a better job at that. And just doing the same thing over and over again, and having the same problems is, is, is problematic. <coughs> So um, we don't have a town hall report. Um, Darian had an injury in her family, like I said. And so um, the finance report is in the packet. Do we have anything, Chief? I'd just like to welcome George Brown back to the police department. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, public services, uh, Mr. Ernest is out. He um, is working with the library contractor to get them to a starting date. Um, we do have the one RFB response for Island Drive, and um, JJ is working on a multitude of 
items, but the one thing that is um, being completed is they're changing the old register heads on the meters so that everything can be read electronically, and that will allow us to be able to do reporting so that we can commence the study on the water rates and prices. As soon as we have all those and there are like 20 left or something like that, we will be able to, to understand what the consumption patterns are across our town, not just um, where we have the new waterheads, but everywhere. And we'll be able to then begin that study uh, of the water rates and confirm if we're doing it correctly or not, if we need, there are many different ways to, to bill for water um, and we need to pick the right one for Happy. So uh, that is um, going to begin probably mid-year sometime. Code enforcement. Officer Brown is coming back. He's coming back as our code enforcement officer as well as a part-time police officer. He has been a code enforcement officer in Howie previously and has consented to, to do that for us again. He will be working uh, the same number of hours, the 16 hours um, in code enforcement and then the balance will be for the police department. He is um, CG certified so has access to those records and we'll be doing a refresher course with the for the certification for code enforcement. I believe that's March. That, Mr. Ernest had the date for that, but I thought it was. Yeah, I think the next one is in March. And so we have code enforcement again, yay! And um, code enforcement, as we all know, is here for the health and safety of our town, but it's also to help us uh, maintain the values of our properties. So I'm thrilled that that's happening. Um, so is. Tour's going to be underneath Mr. Ernest? For the, t yes, for the code enforcement, he's working with Mr. Ernest. For the part-time police, he's working with Chief Thomas. It's a split very much like Becca. Becca is, is split as well. So she works town hall and she works um, public services. Um, library. I do not have the library report. Jojo, do you have a copy of that? No. So she has statistics for January. She said the total items loaned um, were 5,624. The total e-books loans were 280, and audiobook, audiobook overdrive load was 241. Uh, magazine 16 um, holdings are currently 12,241 items. Um, we had 162 hours of patrons uh, using the public computers, and we were open 26 days in January. Uh, the interlibrary loans, which is great. We have a lot of people outside of Howie that come to Howie for our system. There's 463, and the items borrowed, borrowed by interlibrary was 475. Um, she has the values for the numbers of copies and the fines and um, different items. Jojo already gave us the um, information on the groundbreaking uh, Dragon Appreciation Day for the kids it happened in January. And the attendance for the month was 95 children, 235 adults, and eight teenagers. So, yay, go library. <laughs> Our town attorney, Mr. Books, do you have anything? No, nothing that I can ask. Um, Councillor Neal. Nothing for the agenda, just uh, by personal appreciation to all town folks and to council members uh, and staff for uh, covering, if you will, me as I've been gone for the better part of three months now because of my illness. But it seems it's not fatal. It seems it's getting better. <laughs> it's getting up, it's back in here, and probably because I'll be back in and be saying things like I used to say, I will no longer be very popular. <laughs> <laughs> I will keep those to a minute, right? Okay. Um, Councillor Neeble did send, or excuse me, Councillor Neeble, I'm sorry. Mayor Pro Tem uh, Conroy did ask for an amendment to the agenda. Um, which didn't make it, but um, he has asked for um, to speak about the bike trail. Yeah, it's, uh, this is just an update. Um, there is a, a master plan, as you guys saw several months ago, 
uh, for Howie and I, uh, Mr. Rowski, our planner, and myself met with uh, somebody from it's called Trails 100. There's an active group all over the county is kind of to meet in the middle. Maybe you've heard me say that before. And Howie is the middle of the county. Lake County is almost the middle of the state. And I'm trying to get the MPO uh, and the Bikers Associations to recognize, once our new bridge is open, the central, it's called Central, central Bike Trail, which is actually comes down 19 and connect it to 455. Now that's, so you got a mixture of Tiberi's, the county, Howie, uh, Mount Bird, uh, Groveland, because some of it's in there, 360. But to get them to really recognize that, you know, if you come by here on the weekends, even during the, during the week, you, we see lots and lots of bicyclists coming through Howie. I think I mentioned before, by having bike trails, it has a, it's, a lot of it's being done under economic impact. So there's going to be the Waikaiba Trail, which will be completed, but I'm trying to get it connected. They're trying to connect it to Tiberi's, and if we get it connected down 19, then we actually will have eventual access to the uh, Cross Florida Bike Trail that runs from, I think, Clearwater through Groveland and then connects to the uh, Orange West Orange Bike Trail. So. Other than that, um, hopefully it will cost us as little as possible because we really have our own bike trail system that we've worked on. And uh, but there's some feasibility studies coming up. And 19 is a, just an ideal place to, to uh, in my opinion, to bring it. So uh, if anybody ever wants to help who's a bicyclist and wants to get involved in that, the more people involved in it, the more likely the county, the state, um, and the other towns are were willing to work with us. That's about it. Okay. Councilman McGill. I did talk about it, which is a surprise, the hiring George Brown. Uh, actually, I approached Darian uh, Burke <coughs> during the week, and I heard a rumor that George is being hired back. She didn't hear anything about it. Uh, she's our HR person, and she's the way our policies are written up. Uh, a lot of the advertising goes through her, uh, applications go through her. As I stated, my complaints in the past about not following 34-4, which we sent to the AG for an opinion, which they would not provide. And after that happened, our attorney, Heather Ramos, said in an email that the chief is to follow the strict word of that policy until mayor and council decide to come up with other wording. And we haven't. So as of that goes, uh, anybody hired from the town and police department part-time or full-time must be approved by mayor and council. And then you got our town policies, the 5.3 recruiting. That also says that the mayor and council must approve all full and part-time employment. 5.3 also says the town will advertise for regular full-time and part-time vacant positions. We did not advertise. We I did ran, advertise. No, I ran by Darian. Darian actually opened those positions on Howie.org and, and they were both either created or edited by her, and she, they were done. Okay, well, I asked her, she said they never advertised. When I, asked her, when I asked her, when she was surprised about him being hired, she goes, I never advertised. Okay, I so that's right from her. I have a response to Derry, and I don't know if she forwarded it to you. No. But, <coughs> she said, yeah, okay, I'm just letting you know what she said to me. Okay. And then she had a conversation with you afterwards. And she's, the next day, because she didn't know we hired him, and then you said, yes, we did hire him. And she asked you, why didn't you go through HR? No, I spoke with her on... Um, she actually opened those positions in Howie.org. I have the administrative function to go back in and look at the who did them. She opened the police position and she edited the co code enforcement position. So she knew that they were open and they were open appropriately and advertised appropriately. Because we, we looked at that. And we spoke. Yeah. I have the print screens for Okay, them. well. And so on January 24th, she and I spoke specifically about the code enforcement position and um, that uh, Officer Brown was going to be filling that position. Um, because we had three candidates, um, and as Mr. Ernest said, one of the candidates was um, offered the position, but then came back and said he couldn't fill it. So it was reopened, and um, Officer Brown was the only one who submitted an application for that, and he's also the best. Okay, one well, to fill it. I will I will show you the email from Darian that says that she was never notified. And she fine. she didn't advertise. She never got an application for George for code enforcement, and she never got an application for George for uh, part time. 
reserve officer. And that's so so with, with that, we, we have to advertise, which wasn't properly advertised, you get the Equal, which falls under the Equal Opportunity Act, which also covers why you advertise the veterans, the disabled, right. and all that. So that wasn't covered. Yes, it also, it wasn't. So also, um, you didn't follow our policy as far as, as far as fire is, uh, falls going through uh, HR with Darian Burke. You're supposed to go through their work for the advertising, the hiring, the applications, the full process, and it wasn't didn't go through as per her. Uh, once, said, once again, Heather Mayer has made it perfectly clear: you must go through 34-4 and have mayor and council approve all part-time and full-time positions. That was not done. Also, George Brown, as we know, officially quit over seven months ago. Not a leave of absence. Not part-time reserve officer quit. And when I brought up the accusations that he was double dipping his own time, uh, you refused to investigate it. Right. That um, and I gave you... closed. That was an administrative function and it's closed. We're not going to discuss that. Yes, I, I am going to discuss it because it's town business. And he's hired back. The reason why you didn't investigate it because he left. No, that's not true. But yes, it is. So now he's back. And as I told you, there's four other dates that are going to be forwarded to the Sheriff's Department now because you failed to do your job. So there's four other dates with with the timesheets. Okay, you have the, already forwarded this, then I think we're No, done. no, I haven't. I'll be forwarding the sheriff's report tomorrow. Okay, that's But right. you have the original ones from the one date. There's four other dates with additional Those were administrative and we have closed those items. So okay. do you have a next item you'd like to move on to? Come I absolutely do. Thank you. Uh, the next thing is the meetings you had. Yes. I sent you an email. I sent an email to the, to the attorney about it wasn't legal to have a meeting when you didn't have a quorum. I actually gave examples back in September 9th when you were running the meeting, you were going to run a meeting, and you recognized that you didn't have a quorum, and in your own mouth, that mouth you said you couldn't have a meeting. And Attorney Ramos was there and said the same thing. We can't have a meeting because we don't have a physical quorum present. So that meeting was canceled. There were several items on the agenda, uh, more pressing than items that were on that agenda rather than the one on the 27th. Also, Attorney Ramos admitted in May 2019, and like I said, September 2019, that you had to have a fiscal quorum present to have a meeting. Uh, past meetings with Councilman Conway, not being physically present, but on the phone, he was actually uh, able to participate, but not vote while he's on the phone. That was made clear over several years, over several meetings. And there's numerous examples. Actually, one with, uh, I think his name's Councilman Mabry, actually called him out saying you couldn't vote, you're not even here, why you vote for yourself to get a raise. That's when Mayor uh, Sears stepped in. I also gave a minimum of four AG opinions sent to the mayor and to the town attorney, saying a physical quorum must be present. And if someone's going to be on a phone, what they allow is interactive video, video that the audience can see the council member if he's not here, and the council member can see the audience, so that they can interact. Four opinions on it that were ignored by uh, the town attorney and, and the mayor. Uh, there was nothing on the 27th meeting agenda that was classified as emergency. I forwarded the definition of emergency as defined by our policies. Also during past, past meetings agendas that were more pressing issues that no one considered to be an emergency that was eventually um, canceled because of lack of quorum. So the January 13th meeting was not legal, the January 27th meeting was not legal, and when my concerns were ignored, and I gave all the examples of the AG's opinions, which frankly outweigh the opinion of our town attorney. I sent a complaint to the state attorney's office and attorney general's office. And they got back to me. The fifth judicial court, Brad King, state attorney. And he said there were two complaints, the Sunshine Law violation and the, and the meeting being illegal. He said, uh, essentially, your complaint is that there was not a quorum physically present at the 27th meeting, and that others appeared by phone. While I agree with you that to take action, there must be a physical quorum at the meeting. Nowhere in section 286.011 uh, is that a requirement for that meeting. So there's no sunshine law violation, but he said you can't have a legal meeting. And he goes on. I also agree that the actions taken by the council at the January 27, 2020 meeting may not be binding based on all that information. So as I pled with the attorney and you, uh, no, they're not binding. 
according to the state attorney, they're not binding. And I pled with you people, you can't do it. you can't have the meeting and you still had it. So now we have to revisit. We didn't have it. Now we have to revisit those. You can say no all you want, but because he says if they don't revisit, then you the town is subject to a, a civil suit. Once again, do, do we need another one of those? Which we don't. So the meeting was illegal. Council, I don't suppose you want a response to that, do you? What's that? I suppose you don't want a response to that, do you? Why wouldn't I want a response? I don't know. You're not asking me. I, I, you said you don't want to talk about any more the emails. We have a whole email chain. Well, I was, and going, to, I was going. I was done with the back and forth in our email chain, uh, but because you didn't, if you want me to respond to what you're saying, I'll be happy to respond. As long as you answer the questions in the email, then I'm going to bring up all those questions that you you, you ignored. So, uh, so if you if you answer those, and I have no problem. Keep it civil. I am keeping it civil. What was not civil are, about that? Badgering. No, I'm not badgering. Um, Yes, you are. No, I'm not, Mayor. Please. Um, Mr. Wilkes, do you have a response? Yeah, um, several points. Uh, number one, there is no inherent requirement when government meetings in Florida, uh, when they assemble to have a quorum of the members present in the room. Uh, there are numerous statutes in Florida or state agencies which have state boards where people come from all over the state to meet, uh, numerous statutes where they are uh, authorized by the legislature <coughs> to meet by conference calls. And that happens pretty much every week of the year in the state of Florida with state boards. Uh, the Attorney General does a really good job on most opinions that they issue. <laughs> and I go to Attorney General opinions to look to see what analysis are. They cut you short. But, I mean, they cut the work short, and um, they're usually pretty good. But they're not always right. The cities in Florida, counties in Florida, have powers that other governmental agencies in Florida, do, other than the legislature, do not have. The power is called Home Rule, and Attorney Generals have nothing but staffs of lawyers with far less experience than I with regard to the powers of cities and counties. We have corrected the Attorney General on occasion during my career when they have misunderstood what Home Rule power means, and they keep looking for authorization for a city or a county to do something. That's not what home rule power is. Cities and counties do not need statutory legislative authorization to do things. They have home rule powers. The only thing they have to check the statutes is to make sure that the legislature has told them they cannot do what they propose to do. And the Attorney General's staff lawyers frequently misunderstand that. They have turnover in their staff the same as everybody else. So to the issue of quorum, I don't agree with, with the Attorney General. They have traditionally taken a hyper strict view of quorums have, having to be in the room. They have to physically be in the room. Well, says who? There's nothing in the Constitution. There's nothing in natural law that says quorums have to be in the room. People can attend by phone, and that is demonstrated by countless state boards that meet by telephone every week of the year. There is no statute that says that when a city and a county meet, the quorum must be present and the quorum is defined only by people being present in the room. There's no statute that says that. There is no statute that says that. And what home rule power means and what the Florida Supreme Court has consistently ruled for approaching 50 years now, a half a century, is that home rule means that if the legislature has not prohibited the town from doing something, then the town can do it. So, all this gets back to the point is you can keep throwing attorney general opinions at me and keep saying that, and I'm telling you, I don't think they're right. And the time, when the time comes, if and when 
the point is ever litigated, although it's not something that is, I don't think hardly anybody in the world cares to litigate, with a few exceptions, uh, that a court's going to look at the issue of home rule and say, well, there's no statute that says they can't have somebody attend by phone, so they can. And that's the, that's the way it's going to, now, there are other governmental agencies, like school boards, like special districts, do not have home rule, and they very well might get hung up on something like that. If they can't show the statute that authorizes them to do it, then they can't do it. But that's different from cities and counties. The Florida Constitution, <coughs> over a half a century ago, gave home rule to cities and counties. It's a wonderful situation for cities and counties that has served the general public in this state really well, because cities and counties need the freedom to be able to administer their jurisdictions and not have to keep uh, journeying back up to Tallahassee every year to get permission to do the things that they need to do for their residents. Um, but school districts, special districts, state agencies, they don't have home rule. They've got to have authorization. It turns out that state boards have legislation. There are numerous statutes that let state boards do this. So, Counselor, I, contrary to what you're saying, I know that you're you're convinced of your position, but I will tell you the Attorney General was wrong, and I think if it ever got litigated, I don't think it ever will, because I don't think it's a big issue to most people. Uh, uh, I think the courts are going to rule that he was way too strict on that. Okay. The uh, actions that were taken by this council on January 27th are entirely binding against the town of Valley and Nails, and the contract that was, the two contracts that were signed are entirely valid, binding, and enforceable against the town. Okay, my first, I thank you for saying that. The first thing you said is you want to give an opinion, an attorney general's opinion. When someone from your own law firm says, you don't do that, you're not here for that. If there's already an opinion in place, you don't give an opinion on an opinion. Who said that? Attorney Ramos at 34-4. That's why we sent it out to the attorney general. She wouldn't give an opinion on it. I so, doubt that she's okay, well, <coughs> well, that's what we said. So, I think we that's the beat that's this a, one. No, yeah, I'm, so I, I have to answer his question. So, the second thing, the home rule is if you look at the attorney general opinions, you have the school board, you, but these are specific to county municipalities, local municipalities, that kind of government. And when you have the home rule and you have your own ordinance, your own law that says you must have a physical mm -hmm. quorum present, how do you go against that? If it wasn't there, you might have an argument, but we have our own law that says you have to have a physical quorum present to have a meeting. That was said to me back in the spring, 2019, by Heather Ramos. Okay. So that, so between that, the Attorney General opinion, and now the State Attorney's opinion saying it's not binding. I disagree with the Attorney, it's not binding and we should do something as a council for it. The State Attorney wanders into areas of which he has no expertise whatsoever. So do local attorneys. So, Councillor McGill, so, go to your next item, please. What about the crowd, Mayor? Yeah. Well, didn't well, you? No, no, Mayor. What about the crowd? I cited. Yes, you did. Can you control the, your your mob, please? <laughs> okay. While we're on the attorney, uh, did you hear that? Enough. <coughs> Councillor McGill. Did you hear Mr. Tootie what he said? I didn't hear anything except for that you were going to continue. Okay, so you're allowing the, the residents to curse at a councilman. Is that right, Mayor? I told you I did not hear anything except you were going to okay. continue with something, and I heard miscellaneous, but nothing. Okay, so you, you let me go. Okay, talking about the attorney fees, and that was a big issue last year and coming into this year, and the question is, other than this meeting, why was the attorney needed, and why do we have to pay him to come, what is it, 350 to $500 every time we come out here? I mean, we're, we're trying to watch the budget, budget, we're trying to be fiscally responsible, and unlike, other than this meeting, I remember the one I attended, you just gave a report on the Venezia and where they were at with a feasible uh, study, which you could have read off from an e email from him. So I know in the past when Mr. Nebel and other mayors were here, they were picking and choosing when the attorney needed to be here. So I think it's something that we need to watch carefully. And, and uh, any comment on it? No, this is your report. What's that? We interrupt you commented on the other thing, so I'm asking if you want to have a comment. 
No, okay. The next thing you did with your abuse of power is you put a memo out to the mayor and council, fellow elected officials, saying that certain council members weren't allowed in parts of uh, government buildings, town buildings. And where does it say in your duties as the mayor in our charter and our ordinance and our policies that says you can do that? Your that memo your said yeah, that for the security, it's a security policy, and it says that only full-time town council staff, public services staff, and police officers are allowed in the utility billing area, specifically because we have money in there. That's where all of our servers are for data security, as well as all of the, the uh, accounting function is back there. And so we do not, I don't go back there, no counselors go back there. It wasn't specifically you or anybody else. But that door needs to be locked, and for the security of that staff, need, and for the security of our finances, it also could easily be an audit item. And, and who's allowed back there? Police. Yep. Town council staff. Public services staff. And cleaning staff. With, and... When they are cleaning okay. staff and contractors, like the telecommunications people or the computer people, when they are attended by a full-time employee. Okay. All right. That is a that as the CEO or the manager of the town, it is important that we adhere to those policies. People have had that policy or verbalized that policy, and it hasn't been adhered to. And I thought it was important to put it in writing so that we all had a common understanding and it could be implemented and followed. But by having counselors, even you back there, I'm mean, not you, back there. I'm saying if you by having us back there. There's no difference than them being back there escorting the cleaning crew in. What you're saying is that cleaning crew can be escorted and they're more trusted than elected officials for the town. That doesn't make any sense, other than you're, you're trying to harass certain people from uh, being friendly with the town staff and having a friendly uh, work atmosphere. So other than that, I can't, I can't see why you did it. Who's escorting them in here at 9 o'clock at night? I'm sorry? Is it, who is escorting them in here at 9 o'clock at night? Who's the cleaning home. crew. The cleaning crew cleans during the day. The contract has been changed. Martha just passed Friday when I was at the gas station getting gas. He, pulled he was up not he in the in. utility area. He, he was pulled in here to clean. So we that's right. going to clean this and not clean that? That's right, because that door is locked and Darian's office is locked. He comes here on Tuesdays during the day to clean the utility area and Darian's office. Otherwise, he cleans the common areas, but he's not back there. And that's kind of the opposite. When I see him up here, he's cleaning the general area and not back there. Tell me what I see. Okay, thank you. I'm done with that. Uh, Mayor Fonda, remember the time the resident came in? I think her name was Amanda Gallagher. She made a complaint about the police department. She spoke up. And when she walked off the podium, you told her to be respectful. But when she walked out of the room, you made a comment in front of the council people and the audience that there was something behind the scenes that we should know, that she's running a business out of her house. You know she's not running a business out of, out of her house? You, you embarrassed the lady, you waited as she walked out of the building and you said that behind her back. And she never got an apology. She's not running a business out of her house. So it's, I think it's something that we owe residents when we're, we misspeak. Um, they should get an apology. So, that needs to be addressed. Ask her. Ask her, Chief. No problem with that. Matter of fact, I saw the way that went down. As a matter of fact, I saw the body cam and asked the tool of police officer, and I complimented the asset tool of police officer the way he handled himself, had to remain calm, with based on the way she was speaking to him. So yeah, I I compliment on both sides. She believe it or not, but yeah, 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 yeah. I do, Chief. Uh, the next issue is, you know, you have your code of ethics, and you know. No one even addressed the time, Mr. Conroy, you got into it, was it November 19th meeting with Mr. Alamente about sitting in the front row? They got pretty heated at the beginning of the meeting. And I brought it to your attention, it was never addressed. I know mean, you got this big code of ethics and we got to be treating people fairly, but it's funny because right after that, and he was accused of getting out of the front row because he doesn't live here anymore, you implemented the ADA requirements to have the two front rows for 
the discipline, which is great, we should have, and then the back area. But it's sad the reason why you did it. No, the reason why I did it I, was I, because there was a tripod just before the podium, and we had people who had to climb over the tripod, and so our safety officer noticed that, said we really need to do something to address that. We are doing things to address all of the ADA components in our, yep. in our area. Yes, I know, I have a brother that's a double amputee and a nephew that's a quadriplegic, and so it's very important to have accessible areas. And so that wasn't at all why, it wasn't targeting at all. It was a safety issue that we needed to address, and that's what we did. Okay, just a coincidence then in the next meeting that he was told, you know, this is hearing more to ADA. Just, just want to make sure. The next thing is something has to be done um, with Mr. Conroy's intentional, reckless, unethical actions towards and an abuse of powers towards an employee. And then picture this, put, put my name to this. He went up to Darian Burke and said to her, uh, you need to pick a side, either McGill or us. And if you can't pick, you don't pick the right side, I can't guarantee your job. Councilor, and then this, this, this actually is I'm sorry, it's but not this, hearsay. this is hearsay. We need to hear this from Darian. Darian needs to talk to okay, me about it. it. I am her direct okay. supervisor, and so if she. But has then he issue, reminded her about what he did to the last clerk. So imagine if I did that. Councilor McGill, we'll move on to the next item. Darian and I will speak. May about I reply this. to that? Please. So. I don't. Think you, okay. Well. I don't think so. so I will. Councilor I will McGill, in a different fashion. Yes, please. It's extremely incorrect. I'll just say that. So we will. We will talk about this. I will talk to Well, he responded, but the attorney was called, and she called you and told her to make it right, Council take her out to lunch. We're moving on to the That's next exactly day. what happened. Everything you're saying, you're speaking for somebody else. Because which, we got to protect our called. employees. We are to protect Council our employees from McGill, your say, from your abuse. Councilor McGill, please go to your next item. Thank you. Yeah. I asked you to, with that hate page that Don, uh, sorry, Dan uh, Powers created, and the threats are being made on it. I asked you to do, make security measures to make it more safe, to report to the law enforcement agencies on who's on that hate page and have them address their personnel properly. You wouldn't do anything. But yet, when the chief of police made a false report against Don Ellis, you ran to the sheriff's department and said an 83-year-old man was a threat to the chief. So you went out of your way to go to the sheriff's department to protect the chief over an 83 year old man, but you wouldn't do anything for a fellow council member. For three meetings, I asked excited. you. So, We've heard about this before. No, so I, I just, I'd like your next I just, item, I just brought it up. Because we just, I had to miss the two meetings because of you. <laughs> Everybody, please. Thank you. Councilman McGill. Thank you, Mayor. I brought up, I sent you emails about the Curtis Robbins position. Uh, he made a, a physical threat towards me. Um, the last meeting I attended, I asked if there was an IT guy for the police department. You and his chief said no, but when I brought up to Curtis Robbins, oh, he said, oh yeah, that's right, he volunteers. I know there's been records requests made to see if he was certified. It's funny because as soon as his record requests were made, he went and got certified in January. So my position is, why is he even working for volunteering for us with what just happened? And we don't even know if he was certified at the time. He should be looked at, we should put it up. Put, uh, I guess, feelers out there as far as see anybody else wants to volunteer or, or make it a, a part time position. But um, that has to be addressed. Uh, emails, email record requests. It, it seems like when I make a record request, like say an email from you to someone else, they're going to charge me. But you're getting free emails. You, the, the, I'm not, I have never made a records request. The only no, you don't have to because you're, you're giving no, emails to you. No. Yes. No, I yes. have never asked. I have never made a records request to this town, or to any employee or staff, for any records. The only records that I have ever received were copies of our attorney's bills. Okay. So next once, once again, you're getting a records request without paying, and they're charging me. Well, yeah, I want to get something. It takes less attorney. than twenty minutes to run a copy of an. Of an uh, it, it takes less than twenty minutes to get an email when I request it, and they're charging me all kinds of ridiculous fees. So it's. It has to work both ways. Again, we have to use get the specifics, and I need the detail. You can't just provide a general item. So please go to your. Okay, next I'll time. give you copies of the emails that you got for free, if you like. I brought this up during uh, spring of last year, as far as jobs going out the bid, and we were supposed to address it. We never did. There are nine, seven items last year 
that didn't go out the bid when required. And contractors want to know why aren't they getting opportunity? But okay. They're, they're so up. again, please provide that in writing. Give me the seven <coughs> items. I, I got it right here. Okay. Right. If you'll hand that to me, then I will take a look at that and talk to the. the uh, and then more people. Piece, And then there's seven other ones I'm getting, which we'll get a copy of this. Okay. Right there, seven. Over a thousand dollars had to go out to bid, and they never went out to bid. Okay. More recently, uh, no one know where, knows where the money came from and asked uh, where the police department paid it. But when I made it an issue, I'm sure you have some excuse, but that never went out to bid. It's well over a thousand dollars. It wasn't in the police budget. You can't do things like that. And once again, I'm the bad guy for bringing up our violating our laws and our ordinances, and but we have to follow these. Okay. No bid went out. Well, I don't even know where the money came from. I'll look at so, that. Well, I know that it was in the budget for Mr. Ernst, but I will look at the bid process. So what you can go on to the next item, please. Okay. The... Actually, are you at a place where you can stop for a second? Because we need a break. We need to run. Sure. So I'll if we can that. take a three minutes, that would be great. Yeah. Well, I, I need a break. Uh, my only out and um right here i do too yep. right, here. right here so um i'm wondering since i asked you to provide detail and information in writing so that we could respond like the items that haven't gone out to bid etc um, I would like you to provide uh, information in writing rather than just going on and on here. So which, if you'll... Which, which one are you talking about? Um, any of the items. Okay, so, no, you, you said I, I did some so things the, I didn't bring up yet. Well, what are you talking about? So um, the number two, I asked you to get information on and provide me information. Number three, number four, number five. When did you ask six. that? I didn't get no email response. I sent this to Darian to send to you on uh, when? last fourth. There's no email from Darian for the fourth from that. Matter of fact, I didn't, I didn't submit my agenda until after that, so I don't know how you your email from the fourth. Can I see that? But I had sent stuff to the to council too. So. And your, your response is where? <laughs> They're on the My response is in the email. I sent it to <laughs> her and I asked true, you yeah. to provide information in writing so that we could have more details so that as a council we could understand what you were looking I, at. I absolutely don't have it. Matter of fact, I can bring up my email on here to show you this was never ever sent to me. Okay. So, so um, in keeping with yeah. that, I would like you to um, find out if there's anything in brief that you need to discuss. Otherwise, I would appreciate for the next meeting if you would bring these items up and provide more detailed information so that we can actually understand if there's a course of action that we could take or determination that we could take um, instead of just going on and on. So Yes, I'm, I'm not just going on and on, Mayor. Uh, I'm stating the facts oh, yeah. here. I'm stating our violations. Uh, you might call it on and on, um, which is disrespectful. Thank you. Uh, but I will provide it when I come to the meeting, but what it seems like I do is every time I show you, I bring up something, I show you what needs to be addressed, I give you examples, all you do is try to cover up and try to come up with excuses on why you're not violating an ordinance or a policy when you are. So, but what I will do is with the agenda items in the future, when you ask, send it right to me what you want specifics on, and when we walk into council meeting, I will give it to everybody. It'd be nice if they saw. Like it a it would, yes, well, it I would love. It would go out with the agenda. We would. You provide the agenda items in in advance. You should provide the backup at, at that time so that we uh, can have it as a council. Yeah, I've, I've never seen that um, given out prior to the council meeting. We usually yes, get it just before. Like we just we got the amended amended items. We got a couple of days prior, so it didn't go out with the agenda items. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I, I, I can see why. You know, you want that, but um, I think everybody like, should it, it just to be respectful to all the counselors who have to well, participate. Well, that's why I want my list for the last year. I'm requested to put my agenda items on the agenda that has been refused, so that people can see what and I want to talk about, and you, and you don't put them on. When I've asked you to provide the details so that we know, understand what action and course of action, I never get a response. Once, once again, I never got the email. No, and but the last I have, time you did I have that, asked you this previously, one and not time, a response. And no. I, yes, only one other time there. Okay. I'll show that next time we're here. Uh, the Venezia, I know. Need a mediator. 
I, I don't think we'll tell you an update on the feasibility study uh, where we're at with it, how much money we spent on it. Uh, I mentioned before about the signatures they already got. Um, they're not questionable. They get over 60% signatures. And I know the amount of money we're going to be spending on this. And we got to really look at between further money with the research and then if it goes to referendum, a referendum, I think we got to pay for the special election. Uh, we got to take that into consideration. So, are we just going to go? No. In um, we should have the study. The study was uh, a draft was received. Comments were made, <clears throat> not by me, <clears throat> by um, our attorney Tom Cloud, and he has uh, getting the details. We expect to have that study so that we can look at it the first meeting in March, and that was discussed at the last. And what's the next step after that once we review it? Then we will determine as a council whether um, we will approve uh, the, the contraction of Avenizia or not. Now what's... Instead of for a referendum or not. Okay. Can they go on their own if they meet the requirements? If we, I know that the law says if they fall under three categories, uh, we can tell them, no, you can't. If they don't fall under them and they still want to proceed forward, we say, no, can they still do that? Can they petition to? No. No. <coughs> no, they cannot. Okay, so you're saying we can shut this down? Yes. Okay. Is it Does it have to be based on a feasibility study and what it says on it, or do we just say, you know, even though the feasibility study, study says they can do it, um, it won't hurt us, but we can still say no. Is, it, is that correct? I just want to make sure, I, I don't know if this is new, so. Well, the feasibility study, tries to come to conclusions with regard to who's going to be benefited and who's going to be hurt by the de-annexation and the town council will have to review that and decide what the town's interests are with regard to that. Okay. I, I, like you said, the, the, raw, the law reads, it's very vague <laughs> the way I read it and it almost looks like they can do it. So I don't know, if that's all I'm asking you. If it's, uh, it's not the easiest action. It's right. not. It's not, and I'm sure it's not done often in the state of Florida. I just, I was told initially, even when we had that meeting at the land appraiser, that if they, uh, the feasibility study doesn't show uh, those certain three things in that criteria, we can't stop them. So, um, I just picking your brain to see if, it's, if that's true or not. Well, I'll be happy to address it at the next meeting in some detail. Uh, I think the, the clock is such that the referendum has to be held by May, I think. Um, so May? Decisions have to be made sometime in the next meeting or so. Okay. I don't know. I just I figured we updated everyone on it and see where we were at with it. Uh, that's it. Okay. Councillor Scott. Yes. I just want to know, obviously we also hired George back, but and he's got two jobs now, so did we hire him back making the same amount of money as he was before as a full time? He was hired back as a full time? So he's just as a, a new hire. Is he going to get paid the same amount of money for the code enforcement job as he is for law enforcement? Which is, yeah. Was that what that job was originally yes. stated for, it the was, same amount of money? Yes. It was budgeted for the same hourly rate. Okay. I don't. I have to go back for twenty. Um, Our new budget. I think we we upped yeah. it. I think either eighteen or nineteen thousand something. Like something that. Yeah. It's the same hours, the same hourly rate. We were talking about uh, the pay. Uh, when I spoke to Darren, and she said there was no money in that, and it was four thousand dollars over budget as far as the paving goes. I spoke to Mr. Ernest about the budget, and he said that he had budgeted for it. Um, it is also a component of our ADA compliance that we had to, to pay that. Um, I cannot speak to and do need to speak to whether it was put out to bid appropriately or not. I know that it was done with several other projects we had in town. We fixed Holly, we fixed Maryland or Mar, uh, and a couple of other places as well. So I don't know if they were independent contracts and it was rolled into one invoice or how it was done. So I have to confirm with Mr. Ernest. Well, and I would think for the future, you know, and if that's the case, if it had to be done for that, that's fine. I don't mind that. But if we're going to do projects, they need to be 
when they're brought up as, as a lump sum of money, they need to be broken down. I agree. This is ridiculous. Uh, okay, well, we're doing this, we're doing this one, we're doing this one, and nobody knows what's being done. We do have to look at our purchasing policy. Absolutely, you're right. And I'm going to ask uh, our attorney something. Tom, you made the comments about what Councilman McGill was asking you, uh, and I noticed you kept saying that they said that you can have a a meeting, but you never said whether or not it was authorized for you to vote via phone. Because up until this point, in the three years I've been on council, you know, I'm not, not pointing out Ed, but Ed was babysitting a house over in Hawaii for a friend, and so he did have to make numerous calls back and forth on, on via the phone, but was never allowed to vote. I, I think that is the, that's at the discretion of the town council. If they want to let somebody by, a council member by phone vote, then that's fine. If they don't want to let the council member vote but just to listen and talk, uh, that's the council's prerogative. And I, they, there's no rule one way or the other about that. So there's no state law saying that they have no, to be sir. present or need a video phone to vote? No, sir. Just an attorney general opinion. If anything, uh, there is an argument that they have that the council members have to be allowed to vote because they're present by phone, so they can't not they can't cannot abstain. But that's a, that's an argument, and that's never been decided, not even by the attorney general. Uh, I think that's what they have interactive the video in there, so they can see each other. And... Well, that that was the that was the circumstances of the I think it was the city of Coral Gables asked for that opinion, and they said that they were going to set it up with interactive video, uh, and the Attorney General took that as a fact, and he said, well, he go along with it as long as certain things occurred, one of which was having the interactive video, but um, I didn't. Yeah, I thought there was two cases that said it, but yeah, whatever. My curiosity was, is if we've set precedents and not doing it in the past, now all of a sudden we're changing it to for an emergency or whatever it was said, but I was told that that following Monday we were going to break ground on the library and it's not been broken yet, so, except for a tree removal. Yeah, there was, excuse me, um, they're uh, working through some permit components and also some uh, material items. So, uh, and Mr. Ernest would have had a report, but he is not here, so he'll have that at the next council meeting. Anything else? Nope. Okay. So, um, our second set of citizens' comments. Um, Mr. Kelly. Just one moment, Mr. Kelly. Councilor Scott is leaving me. Yes, he has to go. I'll listen to you. <laughs> I didn't have much to say, Mr. Kelly. That's unusual. Oh, I don't think that's a blessing. Okay. Well, uh, I want to, I want to uh, address the council. I, I have several on several occasions, and I, uh, I just have to tell you, it's it's in my soul that I care a lot, and that's what I do. Uh, thank you for this time. My name is Dale Kelly. I live at 601 South Dixie in uh, Howie in the Hills here. Uh, about a, a special, uh, about a month ago or so, and maybe what we were talking about on the 27th, I'm not sure, but. We, there was a meeting over in Tiberi's at a building, and I went over there to that meeting to speak. Um, at that meeting, I brought up <clears throat> um, that I really felt like the city of Howie needed to develop a master plan of where we're going, where we're headed, what we, what we would like to see this town like in the future. I know that a lot of places use uh, land use plans and sometimes they're mandated. And so that's what I ask for. But but I'm here tonight to reiterate that I love Howie in the Hills. And I've lived in uh, Central Florida. I was born in the land uh, in 1955. And in 1977, I got married. And uh, we've lived 30 plus years in the Winter Garden, Howie in the Hills area. And uh, we prefer Howie in the Hills more than any of the 13 homes we lived in in those 40 years. Uh, it is a wonderful community, wonderful neighbors, and, and, and a history that's 
just kind of enchanting. I mean, when you when you read about the town and its founders. But what I'm what I came about tonight is to let you know that how is a place, or I feel like it's a place, and that's why I came here, that has oversized lots or acreage, and that's the type of home that you want. Now, you know, when this big subdivision came up, that you know. They had some 4,000 or 4,500 square foot lots, which is nothing 40 foot wide and stuff. So I, that's why I, I'm bringing that up. But I've been following the Facebook. Try not to make too many comments or anything. There's hate and, and uh, lawsuits flying around and stuff. But I have to say this. Uh, my impression of the cost of running the city having our own police department, even though it costs a little more, it's worth it. It's not a matter of more taxes, but how much you enjoy this small town of less than 2,000 people. Because it's only 2,000 people or less, we have to pay more to have services. So I understand that, and I knew that when I moved here. You're at 30 seconds. I'm at 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Well, my last request is, that as a, as a citizen of Howie concern is if I could ask you, Mr. McGill, if you would reside. If you would give us the pleasure of having our town back in peace, uh, not in a hateful way, but your personality doesn't really fit our, our community. And I know that there's a recall thing, and I think that's ugly too. Uh, but Mr. Kelly. That's what I'd like to do. I'll just leave it there. I've got more, but that's it. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. No, I'm not resigning. Okay. No, I'm doing my job. I appreciate that. Take some public comments. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mr. Kelly. Um, Mr. Benson. Mr. Uh, Benson, 406 South Florida. You usually do. Well, I'm going to comment. Uh, on the telecheck, uh, he didn't offer oh, it was a for citizen comment on that item. But uh, I appreciate the meeting that we had uh, on Thursday uh, with the uh, Public Service Department. And I guess I'm having to uh, publicly uh, concede defeat on the telecheck and the efforts. But uh, with the home rule, that you just mentioned, uh, I don't understand uh, why we have to lose on the flood zone. Uh, and I'm going to ask you if uh, I was expecting you to indicate something on the flood zone and wetlands pertaining to the Telache because you're going to give a rundown on there's a lot of people I don't know if they're here that uh, I was representing in the request for safety on our road, but they're also interested in the development of Talache. Uh, unfortunately, our, our past council locked us into this development and uh, I always thought that our comp plan uh, was the Bible, as I mentioned in our meeting, but we're locked into last comp plan. I don't know if that item was uh, changed or not since then. But um, would you explain to the audience what was explained to me on the flood <coughs> zone? and the changes that are going to come with that and the changes that uh, are potentially come and the changes that potentially will come to the wetlands that's in the bottom of that bowl that they're going to develop. Uh, and I'm referring to the fill. And uh, so that, that's my request to you. So the audience will get it from you and not from me as a kind of biased citizen. Uh, and I hope that we 
we learn from this for the next development, as I mentioned in the meeting. So because this is public comment, I'm not going to respond right now. Um, I will put this as an agenda item on the next February meeting so that we can talk through the points that Mr. Benson has, or the concerns that he's just voiced. Um, Fran? Sorry, I was in detention. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, the Boy Scouts came tonight. They would like to thank you personally, Mayor, and um, the residents for putting them in scout uniforms. And the boys have been working really hard. Um, they will be at um, all council meetings going forth to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and thank you for your support of them. We have new boys that have joined, and uh, so now I'm going to ask for more money. <laughs> Because we had one here tonight that didn't have a stitch of a uniform, and I don't have all my uniform pieces for all of the boys. So, um, also we have a brand new scoutmaster, uh, Jim Copenhaven. He is replacing Bruce Formholtz, which was our, who was our former scoutmaster. So Bruce is here tonight. We'd like to thank him for all his service um, to the troop. He's continuing. Uh, to help us, um, but just not in the role of Scoutmaster. So the boys have big plans, and they really feel like they have been rejuvenated by the support and interest of the town. So I think you'll see them at many more functions in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Miles. Clearly? Yes, thank you. I'll try speaking into the mic so that I can speak as loudly as Mr. McGill did throughout the meeting. However, the reason I'm here, I am the chair of the recall committee to recall Matthew McGill from this town council. I just wanted to provide an update as to where that recall petition stands. The first petition was completed and Mr. McGill was afforded the opportunity to provide a rebuttal in the second petition. The second petition was turned in on the 13th of January with 262 names signing it. The petition was turned in to the supervisor of election that day. That means that he has 30 days per chapter 100.361 of Florida statutes to provide his certification as to whether there were sufficient signatures. The requirement was for 165 based on the rules. He has informed me as recently as this past Friday afternoon, that yes, there are enough signatures for there to be a recall election. He will be providing that to the town not later than Wednesday, the 12th of February. The town then has five days to provide to Mr. McGill a notice for him to have the opportunity to resign. They also have the requirement to approach the Chief Judge of this circuit to set the election date. The election date likely will be in the first half of April. The precise date has not been set yet. If he decides not to resign, the election will be between 30 and 60 days after the end of that five-day period. 
The period of time thereby is sometime between March 20th and April 19th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Tewitt? but that's too easy. What I'd like to do is kind of focus on town business, something I'm very concerned about, have been concerned about a while, but haven't been able to really talk about because of all the disruptions. And that is, I uh, read an entire article by a group called Fiscal Rangers, who are a nonprofit group of financial people that go through all the budgets in different towns. And what I read on Howie was pretty horrifying. It seems like we could have thousands of dollars unaccounted for it because we don't have the proper accounting procedures or any of that. Now you're going to hire that guy, um, the financial guy, which is a good idea. Um, my, my, my suggestion at this point is to hire a qualified city manager. I think we're at the state where we really have to have one. Uh, we have Talashe going in with 100 houses. I don't know how long we'll keep Venezia, but they're paying taxes. Really, that's something we need. And obviously, our, um, our uh, uh, administrative staff is out of control. And, uh, no matter what he says, I know he sits in the air with... Um, hey. No? No accusing. Just okay. You're coming. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, that's one of the things that has bothered me, and I'm really concerned about our financial system, because we all here pay taxes here, and we want to know that they're staying in the town and they're being properly taken care of. All right, so thank you. Thank you. That is the last item and the last comment. So I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>